This is the Tory Leadership Election podcast brought to you by Conservative Home. Welcome to the sixth Tory Leadership Election podcast. This is Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, back after what seems an eternal absence from the podcast. And I'm joined by Henry Hill, deputy editor of Conservative Home, and Andrew Jimson, um, associate editor of Conservative Home and Boris Johnson's biographer. Um, so um, even though I've um, been away for a bit, I remember that the way this all works is I ask someone at the beginning um, what the next week has in store. This week I'm going to ask Henry, just pausing as I do so, to note that by my admittedly errant calculations, we are only, I say only, halfway through the membership stage uh, of this leadership election. So with that fact firmly entrenched in your mind, Henry, can you tell us what we're in store for this week? Uh, so there are three major pit stops on the Trail of Tears this week. Uh, we have the hustings in Perth on the 16th. We have the hustings in Belfast on the 17th. And then on the 19th, which is the Friday, we have the hustings in my old stomping ground of Manchester. Now, these are going to be quite interesting, I think. Obviously, this is my beat, being Scotland and Wales, uh, being Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, the Scottish one, we'll get to hear more from the candidates about what they plan to do about Nicola Sturgeon, giving Liz Truss more opportunities to be unrepentantly rude. Um, and Rishi Sunak more opportunities to criticise her for not having a plan. But I think the most interesting one is going to be Belfast, because, of course, one of the big questions that the government's going to have to deal with, in addition to the cost of living crisis and everything else, is the protocol. And I think this is a really interesting one, because obviously Liz Truss owns the protocol because she passed the bill. And Rishi Sunak, who opposed it in cabinet, has been hiding behind this piece of legislation somewhat because what he said is, we have a bill and I will back the bill. But of course, the bill doesn't actually fix the protocol. It merely creates the powers for the government to fix the protocol. And I think this will be an interesting chance for Tory members in Northern Ireland uh, who do exist. I don't know how they're going to fill a big room, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. But um, to press him on what the actual plan would be if he won. And so that will be very interesting. And then, of course, Manchester is sort of the big, classic, successful northern city. Quite an interesting angle on levelling up. But yeah, those are the three debates this week. And then inevitably, the two campaigns will take pot shots at each other and, and all the rest of it. Let's just linger for a moment on a subject you very acutely raised, which is the protocol. Because um, looking ahead to the autumn and winter, and you know, discussing more of this with Andrew in a moment, um, we will have a new Conservative leader who didn't win the support of a majority of their colleagues, whoever it is. Um, we have a drought. We have a war, energy crisis, inflation, etc. So really a big question for Liz Truss, if she wins, as we're told she will, is going to be, what does she do about the protocol? Because from the point of view of the, the ERG, um, this still sort of powerful force in the parliamentary party who calls Boris Johnson uh, quite a bit of trouble and some of the leading members of the ERG came out against him. Yeah. They're not going to be satisfied, are they, simply with slapping this bill uh, on the statute book with its provisions. They are going to want to enact the provisions in the bill, are they not? They are. And I think that the test for the government has always been may judge striking the right balance between obviously provoking a full confrontation with the European Union is one which would cause an awful lot of pain for the government at a time when the vote, when the electorate are suffering a lot of pain anyway. Um, so you've got to strike the right balance. Now, I suspect that if you look at what the government has done to date with the protocol, it has been the salami slicing, you know, the, the, the extension of the grace periods, which have now become indefinite grace periods. And when that was done, there was an awful lot of hue and cry about how Europe wouldn't accept them. And then, of course, Europe has basically accepted them. And we now have more than a year of British goods flowing unrestricted into Northern Ireland and the single market shows no sign of collapsing. So I think that the clever way would be for Trust to not task David Frost with it or someone who's going to pick lots of very big and public fights, but to basically start salami slicing the problem. Whether or not she is inclined to do that or would prefer to try and sort of rally the base by having a big showdown with Brussels to distract from domestic rows elsewhere is an open question. Because the salami slicing, I mean, dealing with this problem in a gradualist way is a fine line, isn't it? Because if she can't manage that, 
the alternatives are doing nothing much, which will cause an ERG riot, or putting your foot on the accelerator, in which case, at the same time as all these other problems, you know, you could, I suppose, potentially be faced with, you know, more legal action, certainly, and a wacky great trade dispute with the European Union right in the middle of an enormous economic and financial blizzard. Well, I don't think the go- yeah, I don't think the government will be worried about the legal dispute so much. You know, they, there's a lot of good optics for them in being sued by Brussels. I think the concern will be if they push it to the point where Brussels starts imposing controls on cross-channel trade. Because that will mean more disruption to supply lines, it will mean higher prices, it will mean more shortages. And that's obviously there there is a patriotic, you know, hand on the windpipe argument that we shouldn't necessarily bow to that. But that's not really going to play with swing voters, um, which as prime minister, rather than as a leadership candidate, uh, Liz Truss will have to pay rather more attention to than perhaps she has so far. Oh, all right then. I mean, this is remark is aging me, but as Ian Dury used to say, reasons to be cheerful, <laughs> one, two, three. So, Andrew, um, just around thinking about this leadership election for a moment, I've, I've been away and I picked up the the papers last weekend and found a marvellous article by Tim Shipman, who's one of the finest journalists of our generation, saying, well, you know, um, I'm looking at all this on the ground and there are a lot of people who haven't made up their mind. I've just been speaking to a, another journalist friend of mine on another Sunday paper who said, well, I've been to one of these hustings, it's very confusing, all these people can't make up their mind. I mean, isn't there a case for saying, actually, this is all nonsense. This leadership election has already been decided if YouGov's poll on our survey, and I gather another poll coming out of the weekend are right, Truss is ahead by 30 points, Many people will already have voted. YouGov suggested the people who say they're going to vote for her will vote for her. And the argument I'm putting to you, just to see what you'll make of it, is that, of course, we have to keep this story going as journalists. Of course, Rishi Sunak's got to carry on fighting and running. But there's a very good case for saying, if you actually look at what evidence there is available, the whole thing's done and dusted. But it would be ridiculous, though, if Rishi Sunak threw in the towel now. And I rather respect him for not doing so and for actually coming out fighting. Uh, and I watched him last night in Cheltenham and I thought he did well. And I thought the, he, uh, the audience sounded very much as though they were on his side, actually. So I think he's, and of course, for him, I mean, he may, he, he, he's an intelligent fellow. He, he may well accept that he can't catch up, the, that it is a running race where the distance between him and the front runner is so enormous that unless she puts her foot down a sort of rabbit hole and breaks her leg, then yeah. um, she's going to win. But nevertheless, he can be positioned for the next time round. And the economic thing is very difficult. I mean, I, I, if I was him, I would be doubling down on sort of the, on, on the very tough times uh, ahead, but we will get through them. Um, because she tends to offer a much more optimistic view of what's immediately ahead. And if that turns out not to be the case, then she could be in a lot of trouble. Well, you, you've just said, you know, Rishi Sunak shouldn't quit. And I'm sure you're right. Of course he shouldn't. He's got to see this thing through. Yeah. Um, in the same way that other candidates who are in a difficult position have had to do in the past. But you're not leaping to um, put the boot into this thesis that the polls are right and this well, thing the is over. Home, the Con Home poll is the magisterial. <laughs> Not survey, to do. Survey. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it probably is right. On, on the other hand, I couldn't help noticing. I, mean, I was I wasn't in Cheltenham. I was just watching it last night. That I thought that Sunak did get the better of his trust, but it may be too. It may, may well be the conventional wisdom in these polls may well be correct. But nevertheless, he ought. It would be very bad. I think if he threw in the towel now, it would, it, it would make make the whole thing ridiculous, I think. Well, one thing I think would be quite intriguing, though, is that if you remember back in the first stage of the contest, Graham Brady and, and, and the 22 were saying they wanted to ensure that members got a vote. And so they had plans in place for if a candidate dropped out. But now, yes. I have no idea what these are because they've not been pressed on them, but I, 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 there is a bit of me that would really love to know if Rishi Sunak threw in the towel tomorrow, <laughs> what the plan is yes. to make sure that Tory members get a vote. Do they just draft Penny Morton at three weeks' notice? He, because he won't. And um, 
having extolled our survey and the YouGov poll, um, I'm now introducing a cowardly notion to proceedings by saying, of course, they could have been right at the time, yes. and something oh, may yes, have changed yes. since. Um, because both the YouGov poll and our survey went out rather inconveniently before the ballot papers were sent. Um, we'd hoped to do what we did in 2019 and send out the survey at the moment the ballot papers were going out. As we all know, um, for reasons many of our listeners will be familiar with, um, CCHQ sent the stuff out later than was planned. So we don't really know. And I just wonder, <clears throat> does Liz Truss's um, difficulty this week, where she said, um, um, I don't really want any bailouts. I mean, her can't mm. now dispute whether that's what she said, but yeah. a reading of what she said in the Financial Times could buttress that view. I'm really asking whether that matters either, because I was watching the survey while she was making her first mistake, um, which was the muddle over regional pay. And I saw the numbers ticking in while this was happening, and they were absolutely unaffected, right? You know, yes. They carried on showing lots of people voting for Liz Truss. So I'm really working my way around to saying, do you think um, her insistence this week that tax cuts were the route to take and her consequent, um, I won't say climb down, but you know, her consequent clarification, as you call it, does that matter at all? I doubt it matters that much. She did get applause for tax cutting. She got applause for fracking. She got applause when she said a woman is a woman. Um, so she is giving Tory members lines to applaud. And I don't think Tory members take that kindly to the media palpably trying to catch out a candidate and damage her. The, I, th I think that may make them more, more, more anxious to believe what she says, even if, in fact, someone's written some article about how some particular tax cut will only be of 69 pence, or if any, value to, um, to, the, to the people who actually most need help. I can't help wondering, though, whether this is the week where the crisis, this great amalgamation of drought, energy, war and inflation, caught up with the campaigns in the sense that, first of all, apparently not in conjunction with Keir Starmer, who's away <laughs> on holiday, Gordon Brown came crashing oh, yeah. in his Gordon Brown way to say we need a, a big plan. Yeah. Sunak then came out in The Times having previously been very parsimonious about spending money to I'm going to organise another yep. bailout. The pressure's then on trust yep. to do something similar. And I have wondered this week if this disjuncture between this beautiful weather, Tory members voting, lots of campaign pledges, some of which are realistic and others of which are not, whether there was a sense this week that that campaign it doesn't really fit with the reality that he's going to greet the new Prime Minister on September the 5th. Well, the reality comes after the vote, doesn't it? So I don't think it's necessarily an insuperable problem for trust. But she does seem to give ground on any occasion when very strong arguments are made against whatever her position is. She does then seem to change her position. Um, yes, this doesn't seem to, uh, to have done her any harm, does seem it? To, and in fact, an ability to perform a U-turn is one of the most essential qualifications for high office. Everyone has to perform U-turns sometimes. And were, were you, just talking of the crisis, were you amused this week by the fact that while Gordon Brown was doing his stuff <laughs> and saying, um, I think his line was to the effect of the crisis doesn't take a holiday, Keir Starmer was on holiday. And Boris Johnson, who a few weeks ago was being told by his critics, get out of Downing Street. We want you gone now. Yes. This moment, be gone. Yes. This week, the very same people were saying, why isn't he here? Yes. Coping with this national crisis. Why yes. isn't Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, taking charge? I mean, this was yes. yet another instance of the strong reactions that Boris Johnson meets, isn't it? It is. I think, that in, obviously, some people hate him with the same bitter intensity that they have done since 2016. Some people have relaxed, actually, because I did, I did some... The, the, the controller of Radio 4 immediately conditioned, uh, commissioned a series of half-hour programmes about the whole life of Boris Johnson, quite a lot of them, 
and I contributed to a couple of these, and it was possible to be much more, I would say, balanced and, and, and to show a certain degree of sympathy for him, to try and actually understand him rather than just bash him over the head and try and get rid of him because at this point he'd announced he was going to, to go. And so suddenly the BBC, which... Um, and, and, and some of this is now transferred, some of this... It's almost a sort of journalistic doctrine of original sin that whoever's in power must be very, very sinful and we've just got to prove it. And so our task is not to say, well, Henry Hill is good in some ways and bad in other ways. It's to say that Henry Hill is a complete is Satan incarnate, and we're we're going to and and Nick Robinson or someone is going to demonstrate this in the following interview. And it's a very frustratingly sort of reductionist idea of journalism, but it's now being applied more to trust and well, more to trust really a bit too soon. Talking of, I mean, on the on the other side of Henry Hill, devil incarnate is. Boris Johnson, angel incarnate, according to Peter Crudders. I wanted to oh, ask yes. you what you make of the, of the of the Crudders campaign, which basically presents the Conservative Party as a sort of financial enterprise, right, that's got rid of its biggest asset, um, has failed in its duty of care to this biggest asset, and will never be able to raise any money again. This is the, yes. the, 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 the Peter Crudders yes. theory. And the people who've let this great man down and destroyed the sacred bond between him and the party um, and the party members of uh, these you know, wicked, evil, satanic MPs yes. featuring yes. A, a man who's even more nefarious and vile than Henry yeah. Hill. <laughs> uh, yes. Graham Brady, the yes. chairman of the yes. Church of what, yes. what have you made of the Crudders campaign? Well, I think Boris Johnson... He did this at the Con Home rally, really from the early days of Conservative Home. He he makes he has a, a really, I would say, unique gift for making people feel good about being conservative. And most politicians are such dreary speakers, and there's almost no one who can do a decent party conference speech, which is, is as you know, an incredibly difficult thing to do. And Boris could do it and can still do it. And so it, um, almost everyone else at the party conference, for example, in the beginning of October, is going to seem pretty dull compared to him. I have no idea whether he's going to try and steal the new leader's thunder or not. He always did try and steal very ah. successfully. He would always steal Cameron's thunder for a few hours. The famous And then leave town. Birmingham um, New Street Station. Yes, that's right. Yes. Where he, was, yes. he, was, he was completely mobbed. And do you think, and just something I've been wrestling with in the back of my mind, I mean, most people who meet Tory members um, these days, who you know from the from the press, um, who I know, give them a pretty good write up and say, yes. actually, you know, they're so much this better is than a, the caricature. This is a very yes. sensible yes. group of people, and the caricature yes. is all wrong. Yes, of course. If you want to critique the election, you'd say, well, you know, you've had Truss and Sunak making them both um, uh, to one degree or another a series of promises, many of which are completely impossible to fulfill, if only because you could never get all the stuff through the Lords and this all that. I, I just wondered, in defence of the members, I wondered if there was a sense in which actually the whole country is not quite prepared for what we're going into, which is this enormous crisis on the basis of massive tax and spending. And the public's really not ready for this sort of massive public recalibration, this recalculation of, of what one needs to do, because this situation is so novel. Um, by the time the inflation crises of the 1970s reached 1979, inflation had been around yes. for 10 years, yes. and there'd been a lot of political debate about it. Yes, Isn't there a sense in which we're having to come to terms very suddenly with... Uh, this new world of inflation and shortages and energy crises, really without any preparation at all. Yes, that's right. And I don't think the political class has, has done much to try and prepare us for it either. But you're right that usually the, to deal with a, something like the oil price shock, was it in 1973? Um, it, it, takes, it takes time. It is, yeah. it is a hell of a shock and no one quite knows what to do and people pretend it can somehow be dealt with without, without harsh medicine. And so the, the politicians have to have several goes at it. And, and then you get someone like Margaret Thatcher, who, and, and she, of course, could have been overthrown 
at any point uh, during her long prime ministership, but certainly in the early stages, the assumption by many conservatives was that this ghastly woman would fail. Uh, it's only in retrospect that we can we can sort of him a sort of you know the, how triumphant um, Alistair Heath and Co can write pieces about how what you know, how she sorted things out. At the time, it was all very very dicey, and it will be again. Just just last, I mean, you know, we've talked about whether the whole thing might in effect be all over, but if it isn't, is there anything Rishi Sunak can do to turn it round? Oh, uh, to turn the race this yes. race round. Yeah, I think he should be thinking about the next race, which might be quite soon. I don't. I, I mean, I think he's doing his very best to turn it round, and he has. He has. He has to some extent adapted under You're fire. You're saying it might be quite soon because it's possible. Well, because that the trust because government will trust government might not be a great success. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? So on that cheerful note, um, <laughs> Henry, what I was doing. When I was his last year, you've been doing since is having sort of who's done well and who's done badly during yes. during, during the week. It's really actually rather difficult when you've just got two main candidates. But has anything jumped out at well, you the, this well, week? This is this is the problem. Having unexpectedly found myself in the seat is that I charged William with not just endlessly picking Truss and Sunak because, of course, their, <laughs> posi- their, their positions don't change, and so no. there was this very repetitive sort of who's the winner, Liz Truss. I mean. I think there's a certain artificiality to the format because it insists that there is a winner. And uh, I think there are some weeks when when everyone loses. Um, but I am going to say, I, you could say Liz Trust. She got the endorsements of Kemi Badnock, which I think is quite significant, given yes. that Kemi, I think, was predisposed to back Rishi. And you, you, she speak, she's spoken warmly about him privately. I think the fact that she said she didn't declare who she was voting for in the MP round was was in, indicative. And had his campaign been going better, she would have been his bridge to the right and to the future. And, and the fact that he hasn't managed to seal that probably mm-hmm. shows that that's the, the snowball effect behind trust. But, but, but I will also suggest perhaps the Labour Party is the winner, because what's become clear is that at this point in the race, normally the two candidates would not be constantly coming out with new policies. And the fact that, and it's, it, it seems to be now quite obvious, you, you read Camilla, Tomini today in the Telegraph saying that Rishi and, and Liz didn't want to have anything to do with each other in the, the hustings in Cheltenham. And it's quite clear that they really do dislike each other very intensely. And, and at, least, at least their campaigns do. It's a very ill-tempered campaign. And so they're yeah. not restraining themselves in the way that we might expect. And so therefore, you know, you say we're halfway through, you know, yeah. um, the bridge over the River Kwai. And the remainder is going to be another three weeks of gifts to Labour press office, which they will store up and just unleash upon the government in, in 24, if they have a, if they have their wits about them. Um, so the loser, I suppose, by the, by the same token, is potentially, and again, this sounds very bleak, but it's the Conservative Party, because I think that, you know, I read Andrew's case and I, and I, and I, was, a, I was a supporter of having a long contest. And I think it is important that we have that we have these debates, and I do see. I, I, I do see. I want to speak up, maybe for the people, for the Boris skeptics, and that the very reason so many of them wanted him to leave Downing Street is precisely because he would not spend the six weeks actually governing. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a tension, but I do think we need to have these debates, and they're very important subjects. But I think the manner in which this contest is being conducted is discrediting the format. You know, given that Conservative Home fought for the member ballot, and the member ballot has been one of the biggest democratisation stages, I think it's very hard at this point in the race, unless things improve, to argue that it has boosted the party and that it has actually been a good thing. You know, basically, we've had an in, what is essentially an internal contest conducted in public in a manner that encourages people who have had senior positions in this government to take lumps out of the government's record. And... I don't think, I think that at the end of this process, I would not be surprised if the conclusion were drawn that this is a format that's only suitable for opposition. And uh, given that Conservative Home has always supported the member ballot, I think that that would be a net loss for Conservative Party members, who I think have acquitted themselves quite well in this race. If you actually, you know, you, as you say, the caricature is not correct. If you tune in and you watch the hustings, they've mostly been asking quite sensible questions. But nonetheless, I do think that the way that this campaign has been fought means that the, the, the losers might end up being, in the long run, Conservative Party members, because CCHQ will have a very good practical case for reducing their input in the next contest. I must say, my impression has been the worst of it 
was the formula of the TV debate, uh, which reached absolute, absolute nadir. Um, I have to say, you know, I, I think, um, you know, my fellow members are doing a pretty good job and um, it has been a bit calmer. But you do have to kind of wonder why it's all the way. I was very struck by um, how Dominic Raab, uh, who's not a very excitable figure usually, produced this piece in The Times um, while I was away on a holiday that basically suggested that if Liz Truss had her hands anywhere near the leaves of power, she would, she would crash the car. And that something has happened culturally in this contest that sort of like wasn't there in 2019. And, it, and, and, and wasn't there before. And the strange thing is that you might have thought that given that Brexit is, you know, Brexit has been the great ideological charging pole, right? It's been the mm. thing that's that's amped up the stakes for the last few years. Brexit's not really on the ballot paper at this point. You know, there are there are arguments about who will do more to make the most of Brexit, but there isn't that existential, X is not a true believer, get Brexit done. And yet it's actually more real-tempered and there seems to be a deeper schism. And I think that in part, it's because the two camps are polarizing and genuinely do not believe in the program of the other side. You know, I think the Rishi supporters genuinely believe that Liz Truss, as we said last week, is basically teeing up a sort of barber boom that will then demolish the party's fortunes. Whereas Team yes. Truss think that Rishi will basically just not, you know, will will not deliver on conservatism and we'll 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 get to 2024 and Britain will look much the same as it did in 2010. And Again, a long format gives more time for these sides to dig in and entrench in the same way that if you look back at, say, the Scottish referendum, by the end of that process, there were much deeper divisions and much more finely, hardly defined divisions, hard, hard, hard definition on the divisions than there were previously. And I think if you went back six weeks or however long it was, these, these camps would not have been there. As much they'd be, you know, there'd be tendencies and preferences, but you would not have had people who think that other people are fundamentally unfit to govern. And I think we might be there by the end of the contest. Well, I think uh, certainly not got time to do it now, but um, next week um, we should uh, get on to, you know, assuming Liz Truss is still in pole position, uh, we can have endless hours of joy next week when we return talking about what a Truss government would be like, who would make up her cabinet and how Downing Street would be staffed, and whether it will all work, assuming that she wins. Um, but that's it for this week. Um, thank you, Henry, and thank you, Andrew. And we will resume in whatever three-person format we're able to for the podcast next week. Bye.